But look, I read an uh, article with yesterday uh, in the newspaper which kind of had me interested from a uh, former uh, person who's uh, appeared on the platform before. And uh, he's written an article about the paradox of excessive government. Eric Cramp- Crampton is the chief economist at the New Zealand Initiative and he believes governments left unchecked can trammel on rights and blunder into areas where they have every chance of doing more harm than good. And he warns that it's when constraints are impossible that constraints on government are most needed. And he reckons our current government shows every sign that it is in need of some restraint in terms of getting involved in people's lives, but it doesn't seem to indicate that it's willing to consider any. Eric uh, joins us by video link now. Eric, good morning to you. Nice to see you again, mate. Good morning. Good to see you. All right. Look, uh, I think in some ways I looked at this article. I read it again last night. You seem to me to be in an academic way describing what is the natural hubris of power of any second term government. And that is that it just keeps on wanting to do stuff because it fears it might be running out of time or it believes it has the right to do stuff. Well, it's a perennial problem, right? How do you bind government? The in defense of excessive government argument was kind of fun. It is an academic one, uh, but it draws on a broader public choice literature. So uh, when I'd done my graduate training in economics, it focused on public choice, ways that we can constrain government, economic analysis of politics and political decision making. Um, Dwight Lee's argument, he was president of the Southern Economic Association in his, pre- his presidential address that year. It just raised this really interesting, fun argument that uh, you can never have a desirable minimalist government because if you're able to constrain government to only doing the small set of things that it can really, really do well, well, maybe you'd want to allow it to do a few more things because it's doing well in these things. So you let yeah, it so do I a few didn't more mess that up. Let's and give it a crack at this over here. Yeah. So and where do we draw then, the line? Do we have any historical academic research that says these are the things the government should get involved in and it should stay the hell away from these areas? Well, I think we need to get back to fundamentals around uh, what New Zealand's fiscal and economic institutions have been, right? So we've had a Fiscal Responsibility Act that has required reasonable cost-benefit analysis, regulatory impact analysis to check that whatever policies government is undertaking do more good than harm. Some of that process seems to have been abandoned. We've had an awful lot of, well, the Fiscal Responsibility Act added constraint that you had to show that you're delivering value for money and ministries competing with each other for scarce amounts of government funding imposed their own constraint. So if we look back to the prior national government, um, ministries always want more money than (laughs) government collects in tax. They have to find some way of deciding who gets what money. And what Minister English had had in place was just vetting on cost benefit analysis over a long period through what they called the investment approach. So that was an automatic check where weaker spending proposals got beaten by stronger ones. When government starts issuing $50 billion in COVID debt and decides that a lot of it can be spent on things that have absolutely nothing to do with COVID, then some of those restraints go away. So the natural constraint that's provided by forcing ministries to sort of bid against each other for a limited pool of resource, you get rid of some of those constraints by adding $50 billion into the mix and there's less discipline that comes in. There's not just the problem around individual rights and getting into areas where they might do harm that way. It's just the sheer volume of change that's going on currently where the public sector doesn't really seem to have capacity to run it all properly at the same time. So normally there'd be a few reform processes ongoing and there'd be lengthy submissions processes on it. Currently, it looks like you've got pedal to the floor uh, across all ministries trying to achieve things, many of which shouldn't be achieved in the first place and really tight submission deadlines as consequence of it and little opportunity for real effective consultation. Okay, give us real time right now the three areas of policy change or development that you think the government has no business being in and is likely to cock up. The fair pay agreements are a disaster. They'll give us um, 
labor markets more comparable to Australia's. That should be abandoned. Government has gone a little bit slower on that one. Fortunately, MB was able to give some good advice pulling back on that one. The income insurance program will be a mess. It will creep larger and larger. Um, and these things have a tendency of going that way. If you look at the European evidence on it, I would particularly want to return to discipline on regulatory impact analysis and in budget bids, making sure that there is proper cost benefit assessment across these. The three waters reforms, the, there are huge problems in water delivery in local councils. The three waters reforms are not nearly the best way of handling that. Castelia has done some good work showing better ways of dealing with this that don't take assets off of local councils and maintain reasonable amounts of local government accountability. The current process isn't achieving that. It's turned incredibly politically contentious and the structures that they've put up won't get the job done. They lay on a whole pile of risk. Mm. I know, Eric, that you are a cold-blooded um, rationalist uh, a a and economist. Uh, I'd look at this and say we're at a stage in the electoral cycle where government wants to do stuff, wants to seem to be proactive, and in some cases wants to do stuff that it may fear it won't get the chance to do if it loses the Treasury benches. Do you yep. see a difference, a philosophical and a fundamental philosophical difference uh, between the approach to government involvement or interference between national and Labor? Or would a national government be just as bad at doing stuff it isn't necessarily good at and that won't deliver the best of results? I don't think that National would be trying to take on as much as Labour is currently trying to take on all simultaneously. So you're right that governments do want to be seen to be doing things, but it seems odd to be want to be seen to be doing dozens of things very badly and having them all fall apart rather than achieving a small number of things competently. Right? Which do you want to have your reputation as, right? The effective home handyman who gets one project done, looks great, then moves on to the next project, that one looks great too, or do you want the house that's half finished, big holes in the roof because he got bored of fixing that part of the roof and started wanting to build a kitchen table? I, I hear what you're saying. And I guess maybe the most recent um, example of that is the uh, tax on GST management fees. What a disaster. Well, it, it was horrible political management. So apparently the process has been undergoing, been in pro play for years. The first I heard of it was when the pro project was announced. There's just so much going on, it is impossible to stay on top of everything. The proposal looked like it could have made actual sense. So in general, if you look back to the tax working group, there are really, really good reasons for excluding financial services from GST when you get into valuation issues. It's just too hard to sort out the value of the service compared to the value of like the financial instrument that's underlying it. You don't want to tax on that financial instrument uh, value. Now, Management fees are a little bit different. Those are strictly carved out. Now, it'd be a bit of a line call. You have to figure out whether there'd be distortions if you tax that thoroughly, if people then try and flip into other ways of managing the investments so that it becomes untaxable. But it was plausibly a really good idea. It would have, had they given some heads up to, especially economists on the right who like clean taxes, so that if national went yeah, off on I, I mean, I have to say, that, Eric, e even David Seymour said he didn't think it was a bad idea, but it <laughs> has to be one of the most stunning political loan goals I've always seen. Hey, I have to move on. Thank you very much. I thought that was a great column. And I think in terms of a basic, some basic questions about real differences in, in forms of government, it was incredibly informative. I thank you as always uh, for your time on the platform this morning. That is Eric uh, Crampton. Eric is Chief Economist for the New Zealand Initiative.